I don't know how you do it all. I really don't. Yeah. Especially since I've been up since three. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you should be up hands. now again. I know. Like and your mind starts going I don't know if they need you to send the blank out. Because I use the same title. Of course, it's 530. So I have to go yeah. down. And then I've got to be up. And then that's when you are asleep. Right. I'm just keeping the audio on now. At 530, I started dozing. Mm-hmm. So two minutes later, I'm going to go. I'll walk down. Oh, I know. You sleep good tonight. I hope so. Yeah. What's that? Uh, no, no, no. What you're going to do, though, is, is she might ask you to just stand up and introduce yourself. Come on. When I had to do the thing for the nap, I said I was a freshman. No, that was so funny. I'm a freshman. Oh, wait. My name is Morgan and I'm a freshman. 10th grader. And she looks at me and I was like, whoa. I was like, wait, what am I? How are you? You guys here for golf? Yeah. Okay. So grab a um, grab an agenda and sign up on the white sheet right there. So you put maybe went to dinner and jumped over. Yeah, it's over the summer. Yeah, bubble lunch stuff. He's like, are you fucking hungry, guys? Both of you. I mean, for two minutes. And he's like, all right, we need to see. I think we're gonna have a wedding and have a dinner. This is next. Why are we both just sitting? You have to stand with the seniors in the house. Yeah, we're all taking up all the place studies. Oh, good news. Good news. Good news. Good news. Good news. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, yeah. 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 Ye
And then uh, if you could remain standing after the Pledge of Allegiance, please. We are going to um, move into a moment of silence for our district clerk's husband, Peter Kuhn Sr. So you could stand for the pledge, please. Senior passed away uh, about a week ago last Saturday. He was one of our amazing soccer coaches, and uh, we're, we're very sad that he has passed. Uh, Peter Senior, um, of course, is June Coon's husband, uh, father to Jessica Brown, one of our teachers at Sidway, and Peter Junior, who was a volunteer soccer and baseball coach, or is a volunteer soccer and baseball coach with us. Peter Kuhn Sr. coached boys varsity soccer for Grand Island schools for many years. He started in 1986 and continued to 2009. Uh, he is currently in the Tonawanda High School Hall of Fame, and uh, that's an honor for his outstanding skills in the area of soccer. Uh, he was awarded the Niagara Frontier League Soccer Coach of the Year in 1998. And he has also been recognized in 2018 as the Niagara Frontier League Cornerstone Award recipient as a result of his lifetime contributions to the sport of soccer. After retiring from coaching boys soccer, Mr. Kuhn began volunteering with the girls varsity soccer program, and he volunteered consistently for many, many years. He was a great son, father, husband, coach, and volunteer, and he will be really missed in our community. So please join me in a moment of silence for Peter Kuhn. Call this evening, we have with us Jay Grover, trustee, Nicole Novak, trustee, Dr. Brian Graham, superintendent, and Ashley Dreyer, president, Sue Marston, vice president, Joy LaMarca, trustee, Daniel Bruno, trustee, Mike Loria, assistant superintendent of curriculum, instruction, and personnel, uh, Cheryl Cardone, assistant superintendent of pupil personnel services, and Dr. Ruby Harris, Assistant Superintendent for Business and Finance. Excuse this evening is Glenn Bobeck, trustee, and Jude Kuhn, our district clerk. Just for the record, uh, Cheryl Cardone will be taking the minutes today. Um, announcements, if we could keep uh, the emergency exits in the back clear, and um, directly behind me there is another emergency exit, and if you could silence your cell phones, please, um, it would be appreciated. Um, if I could have a motion to approve the agenda for March 21st, 2020, 2022, please. And a second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0. Um, if I could have a motion to approve the minutes for March 7th, 2022, please. I'll motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0. Um, we do not have an ambassador for the middle school. The ambassador called in um, ill. So we will move to the high school um, where uh, Jacob Jamie will give a report for the high school this evening. My name is Jacob Jamie, and I'd like to thank the board for having me tonight. Um, I'm the ambassador for the high school this week. So the first announcement is, we are proud to announce that we were able to bring back the clash in Viking Spirit Week. Each day this week, students will support their class to show school spirit by dressing up. Today was Cowboy vs. Country Club Monday, tomorrow will be Twin Tuesday, Disney Character Wednesday, Blue and White Thursday, Class Color Day Friday, and we will end our class week with an annual Clash of the Vikings competition on Friday night from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. In addition, Donate Life is once again putting on their Donate Life Awareness Week. 
All week we'll be spreading awareness on how to get involved to save lives through blood and organ donations. Uh, we have received confirmation from the New York State Education Department that Ravens exams will be administered in June and August of 2022. Our teachers are working hard to prepare students for their upcoming exams. Also, as of last week, all spring sports have been started, and that includes baseball, softball, lacrosse, track and field, boys tennis, and unified basketball. Um, our DECA team went to state the last week, and this was very important because they have not been in an in-person competition in over two years. And this year, our students captured 53 top five medals throughout the three-day event. Also, a special congratulation goes out to seniors Justin Horvath and Evan Wallace for earning second place for sports and entertainment team decision making and for qualifying for a spot in the DECA national competition. Good job, guys. <laughs> um, a special thank you goes out to Mr. Loria, Ms. McMahon, and all the staff members who run our superintendent's conference day last Friday, March 18th. Our teachers had opportunities to participate in meaningful work sessions that focused on a variety of skills, curriculum, and mental well-being. Our Grand Island High School PTSA generously sponsored a breakfast for our high school faculty on the morning of Superintendent's Conference Day. We thank them for supporting a variety of events, activities, and scholarships for our high school students. They have also recently made a donation to assist us with purchasing extra Chromebook charging stations at our high school. That's all for me. Okay, that brings us to correspondence, recognition, and good news. And we have some of our DECA state champions uh, here with us this evening. Um, if we could have them come up and introduce themselves and share a little bit about the competition, that would be wonderful. Raven's our spokesperson. Okay. I don't care. Hi, my name is Raven Chris, and I would like to introduce my fellow DECA members who attended the 62nd Annual DECA Conference in Rochester this past week. If you could please stand up and announce your name and what event you competed in. I'm Adam Schnell and I competed in Principles of Business Act. I'm Alma Brown and I competed in Marketing and Merchandising Team Decision Making. I'm Holland Lynch and I competed in Entrepreneurship Team Decision Making. I'm Justin Horvath and we competed in Sports and... Sports and... I'm Megan Pinzel. I competed in hospitality services team decision making. Um, I'm Jacob Chaser. I competed in buying merchandising management team decision making. I'm Lori Padra and I competed in food marketing. I'm Anna Kersaltz and I competed in entrepreneurship. I'm Bethany Kulikowski, and I did a community service manual. Since middle school, most of these students have been participating in the DECA curriculum to prepare themselves for these competitions in real life situations. In eighth grade, during my family and consumer science class, I started to learn how to apply myself in the real world of business. I learned how to write a resume, practiced doing mock job, mock job interviews, and completed my own personal disk ass assessment, giving me information about my personality type and how to best interact with others. I've also learned through the years what I think is one of the most important skills to possess, public speaking. With the help of all my teachers' support and the things I have learned, I can now stand in front of all of you today without talking, talking to a room full of people without feeling any panic. The DECA curriculum has not only taught me real-life practical things, like how to act in an interview and how to fill out checks, but also how to talk to people of any age, no matter my relation to them, without being flustered. As an example, I met a boy named Max Zentz on this trip. He attends our Grand Island Middle School and is an 8th grader. He's the first middle schooler to come along to DECA states and advancing from the regional level for him was extremely impressive. I hope to believe he will move on with the Academy of Finance and DECA courses to continue competing and learning. Since middle school, many others and I have taken part in DECA courses and Academy of Finance courses. This has guided me through high school so far, giving me mandatory business classes to talk about different topics. So far, I've taken entrepreneurship, accounting, and career and financial management. I will continue for the next two years with more courses. During the DECA competitions, there are 50 events that you could choose to compete in. 
Some of these specific courses that we are taking here in school. Students representing Grand Island competed in 25 different events, including written manuals as solo competitors or teams. Evan Wolowitz and Justin Horvath competed in the Sports and Entertainment Management event, which was a class they took their junior year and won the opportunity to advance to DECA Nationals in Atlanta, Georgia. This was an extreme accomplishment since states this year was a hybrid event, and only two competitors from each category in person got the chance to advance. 1,740 students competed this year, and out of that, only 640 were in person and 1,100 were virtual competitors. In addition to, du to Justin and Evan's great win, 53 medals from the Grand Island DECA team were brought home with us after states. These medals consisted of top 10 in your test score, top 10 in your role play, and top 10 overall, so the two scores added together. My partner and I personally brought home a medal for top 10 in our role play. Our category was entrepreneurship, a class I took my freshman year. This was my first year attending states, and I was a little unsure of what to expect. Although the whole year since September, Mrs. Chamberlain, along with Mrs. Boutte and Mr. Simpson, have been preparing me and other students for the competition. I stayed after school countless times to go over practice role plays and got unconditional support from these teachers. Something that really helped me and many others go on this trip was the fundraising we did. Because of the travel fees and other factors when we attended states, there was a price to go on this trip. I worked along with many other students to help run the concession stands during sports games for the football season and basketball season. For this we got paid and could take money out of the price of going to states. This really shows how inclusive DECA is for all their students. Anything our teachers could do to help us, they would do with no hesitation. Since I'm a sophomore, I'm lucky enough to go along for these competitions for two more years, and there's no doubt in my mind that I would not want to go. Going to DECA states was an experience I will never forget. On the trip alone, I met hundreds of new people who were my age from all around New York State. I also took part in many workshops regarding things I found very useful, such as social media management and personal branding. With these opportunities, I grow into a more mature and professional person, and I know my abilities will continue to grow as I continue to learn. Truly, DECA is my sport, and I look forward to the more experiences that I can have with it. Thank you. Uh, Evan and Justin, when are nationals, and where will you be headed for that? Uh, well, you, you know? see. <laughs> it's April 23rd through the 28th. Okay. In Atlanta. Yeah. Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. Great. Yeah. We'll be anxious to hear all about that. So yeah, congratulations. We, <laughs> we, we, Stand up. Oh, you're not sure. Okay. We decided not to go. Oh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> our, we're both in AP classes, and the next week is a heavy AP test, so we decided it was best to stay back and study and prepare for that. And he's got baseball. It is so, it's like, it's like, uh, it, it's amazing. Um, they just, they, they turn it on. They've been together since freshman year for, and in this event, and every year they've been doing better and better. Last year they were virtual national winners and uh, went on to nationals virtually, but this year, um, unfortunately, they can't they can't attend. I can't attend either for, for personal reasons, so I think that's the reason they don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> and they have the old lady. Uh, yeah. but, um, but we just want to thank you, um, and Raven put it very, very well, very eloquently, actually, that you have been so supportive of our program and our co-curricular program. And um, Mr. Loria and uh, Mrs. McMahon came and visited us in Rochester, and that was the highlight of our trip. So um, thank you for that. <laughs> um, when no other admin came, our, our admin came. So we really appreciate that. Dr. Graham was ready to go. Yes, yes. I think a lot of people wanted to go. I know, I know Mr. Broker wanted to go as well. We had a lot going on here. But again, thank you for supporting uh, this. The reason, co uh, by the way, I'm wearing NAF today as well because we had a NAF conference today. But the uh, authenticity of the programs that our business department provides um, are really what our students enjoy a lot because they get real life experience. So thank you again for being so supportive. Thank you for everything you do. Congratulations. We'd love to get a picture with our... Yes, and this is when Stanley's eight. doing an amazing job in middle school. I just <laughs> yeah. want to plug her. Just, yeah. Just a plug. You guys
Good evening, everybody. Um, there are two action items on our curriculum agenda. One of them, the first one, is our district calendar that we're bringing to you for our recommendation for the 2022-2023 school year. Just to highlight for, well, there's no students left, but they will be starting school um, potentially on September 6th. Oh, there you go. Sorry, I didn't do that. Just you guys. We're here for the long haul. So um, we're asking the board to take action on that for the calendar. Um, it has been approved by our Grand Island Teachers Association as well. The second item for action is a overnight field request for the 2022-2023 school year. It's so weird to say that. Um, for our chorus students who will be potentially attending Disney World for a music festival there as they have in the past So we're hopefully bringing back some of our music field trips going into the future So if the board would like to take action, we'll ask for A and B. Okay, if I could have a motion to approve uh, curriculum items A and B, please I'll motion. And a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6-0. And Ashley, I do have for the, you could, well, I'll let you move on to personnel, but I'm going to have a change, so we'll be ready. Okay. Oh, there's one for each. Okay. okay. And that brings us to personnel instructional. Um, if I could have a motion to approve PI1 and PI2, please. Well, I'm going to oh, hold you there. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I'm going to ask that you, uh, we're going to remove P, PI1A. Um, we got notice today that our, subs our teacher that was on leave is returning this Thursday, so that action will no longer be needed um, in terms of the appointment that we have there. So the teacher will not hit the 40-day mark and will not need to be recommended for that particular okay. appointment. So what I'm asking for is approval on PI1B through, I believe it's D, and then PI2. Okay. And a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion to approve PI1 B to D and PI2 uh, approved 6 to 0. That brings us to personnel non instructional. Um, just for informational, this is not going to affect the action, but for informational, very, under P and I3, Don Barast is the clerk typist currently at. Um, Sidway Elementary, and she's going to be transferring to the high school. So on there, it actually has it um, switched in terms of where she would be going. The buildings are correct. So just to let everyone know that Don's going to be working at the high school, um, not at you. Thanks, Joe. I'm okay. asking for action on all of the other items, which is PNI 1 through PNI 2. Okay, if I could have a motion to approve PNI 1. PNI 2, PNI 3, and PNI 4, please. I'll And just, you wanted 4 too, right? You know? 3 and 4? Sorry, 4 as well. 3, okay. we need to take action on three, this 3, we don't need to. Okay. If I could have a motion to approve PNI 1, PNI 2, and PNI 4, please. I'll And just second? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Well, it doesn't matter. Okay. And J second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0 to approve PNI 1, PNI 2, and PNI 4. That brings us to finance with Dr. Harris. So it's going to be a doozy of the night. 
So um, my action items are actually B, C, D, E, and G. B, C, D, E, and G are the action items. Um, so B is obsolete equipment in the high school. Uh, C is a bus bond approval that is actually for uh, the current school year that does not pertain to the next school year. In the future, that will be part of the reorg meeting. Um, the next item, D, is an obsolete item in district office. There's a chair that's uh, extremely old and been sitting off to the side for a long time. Uh, e is UPK contracts. Uh, this kind of just goes through the process that was used. We are um, partnering with Carolot, Kinder Kids, and St. Timothy's. Kinder Kids dollar amount is incorrect. The rest of their contract is correct. So the per slot for the students is $5,021. Um, I did confirm that again with them today, but there, there's an update there. I will put that on again for information so you just have the correct uh, contract. Um, but we are excited and we are hoping to fill all 90 slots and that lottery will begin within, not the lottery, the application process will begin within the next two days. So uh, that is something that if you have a student that will qualify for UPK, make sure you get that in. And then um, we also have budget transfers over 15000 So those are all the action items. Any questions? If I could have a motion to approve action items B, C, D, E, and G, please. I'll motion. And a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0 to approve B, C, D, E, and G. Okay, so item A is the check warrant for February, and item F is budget transfers that are under the $15,000 threshold. I Thank you. Know. I just want to um, question the um, thing that was brought up by one of our community members at our last board meeting on the car rental for the um, conference. Uh, I believe you said there was four for um, weird relationship issues. I just would like you to clarify that for the board and our community members. Um, so I was able to look into this through reviewing what has been approved over the last couple of years, especially with COVID. Um, I do believe what was being referenced was a uh, district office staff conference. Um, there were two cars that were rented and utilized. Um, one of the attendants is actually a district clerk, so there's things that she prepares for the Board of Education to make sure that she's good to go beforehand. So we take that into consideration for schedule. And then they also take different course offerings. So we look at the schedule ahead of time to make sure it makes sense for people to go the full five days. It's a, it's a long conference. So if we allowed everybody to go in one car, you may be paying for additional nights in rooms that are not needed. So those things were taken into consideration. Um, and they also share rooms to cut down on cost. Uh, so you don't have one person in each room, they do share uh, the rooms to cut down on the cost. So we did review that and that was what was found. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that brings us to special education, pupil personnel services. All right, I have um, two items, please. Um, the CSC uh, program recommendations and also the CPSE program recommendations, please. Okay, if I could have a motion to approve those, please. A motion. And a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6-0. Okay, thank you. That brings us to the superintendent's report with Dr. Green. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here again. And for those of you watching at home, we really appreciate your interest in our district. Uh, today, I do want to share some information <clears throat> that is not COVID related, and it's uh, more focused on an initiative that we're going to undertake uh, with our family support services team and some high school students. So just a little story, uh, you may recall on December 16, 2021, uh, I sent an email out to all of our families letting families know that there was a TikTok challenge or a TikTok trend 
that involved um, promoting threats of uh, harm to schools. Uh, so on this slide, there is just some notes and then a, a picture of the email that I sent. And I believe um, I sent that at about almost 6 o'clock in the evening. Uh, on the same night at 9.30, a, a, an excellent parent reached out to me to let me know that that parent was aware that there was a threat that appeared uh, to be focused on Grand Island High School. I began an investigation that evening. Uh, we collab I collaborated with the Erie County Sheriff's Department. Uh, I met them uh, here at school. Uh, we worked until midnight, and we discovered that that threat originated in Florida, but was shared and reposted and reshared over and over again uh, till it ended up here in Grand Island and got shared over and over again on Snapchat. And after that investigation, I sent a letter out to our community. It was just after midnight and explained uh, what we had discovered. Uh, the next day, I started to reflect um, that uh, behavior or impulse of students to share uh, posts online that appear to be threatening in nature and threatening the safety of our students without sharing it with a trusted adult first. So I really began to think about what is happening, you know, not just in Grand Island, but across the United States with this, uh, this impulse for kids to share something that could put themselves in danger, but never tell a trusted adult. Um, I put this slide together today. I just did a quick Google search. This was happening all over the United States, not just in Grand Island. And uh, it was all happening uh, with this supposed threat that was targeting schools on December 17th. So we talked about it with uh, Cheryl and Jessica Hutchings and Robin Kwitek, and I think she had identified a documentary called Like that she thought would be uh, a good tool for us to review. So Jessica Hutchings is our social worker. She is in charge of our family support services program. And she reviewed the film and encouraged uh, Cheryl Cardone and I to watch it. And uh, we really found it to be a powerful film. So, uh, so we decided then to show all of our administrators. So we had a meeting last week and all of our administrators came together and we watched the film together. And we brainstormed ideas on what the messages were in this film and how we could use it as a tool for educational purposes with our students. And the big message is, how can we help our students self-regulate and find balance uh, in their lives when it comes to social media? Uh, some of these images uh, are from you know, screenshots of the film. Um, you know, here are this young lady saying, there's really no point in talking to people now. They're just always on their phones. So uh, we have the pleasure, uh, Mr. Broker, uh, Cheryl Cardone, myself, and Jessica Hutchings, uh, shared the documentary with their high school student advisory team last week, Thursday. And all of the students on this advisory team that represent 9th, 10th, and 11th, and 12th are committed to wanting to teach our middle school students uh, some tips and tricks and um, strategies for finding balance in their lives when it comes to social media. So Mrs. Hutchings put out a sign-up sheet and I would say probably 12 students uh, volunteered to work with her on an educational assembly or program for our middle school students. And I know Mr. Broker and Mr. Fitzpatrick will work very closely with this team and Mrs. Hutchings and I think Brody, our social worker at the high school, will all collaborate on building this educational program for our students. And then we also plan on having a parent night to invite all parents in our community and even outside of our school community, uh, you know, St. Stephen's parents, any parents that are interested, will have a preview of this film in our high school auditorium and we'll have high school student panelists be available along with some of our adult professionals to answer questions and to help our parents uh, learn more about this uh, what I would say is an addictive uh, nature that we have to our phones and to social media. 
here on this slide, it says there's two billion people with smartphones and on average, uh, those individuals check their phones 150 times per day. And for many, some of that's for many good reasons, right? You know, work related or, you know, connecting with family or friends. And for some of it, it's, it's uh, controlled by the social media uh, companies that want you to get back into their application because they're making a lot of money uh, when we're engaged in that environment. This was uh, an interesting quote in the film. Uh, Max Dossel works with the Center for Humane Technology, and he says uh, that you're, we're not just the customer, but we're the product being sold to others. So when we're spending more than two minutes in a Snapchat or TikTok or Facebook or Twitter, uh, our eyeballs connected to that content is being sold to advertisers. And I'm sure all of us have experienced uh, you know, looking at a particular ad and seeing that ad pop up you know, multiple times on our, in our smartphones. Uh, so this film kind of breaks it down, it breaks down the brain science behind uh, how, uh, how the social media companies create algorithms to draw us in. And in many cases, it's for good, right? Like to connect with our family and our aunt and uncle or our grandma that lives in Florida. And for many cases, it's also not for good. It's designed uh, it's for advertisers and it's designed to keep you connected. Um, and that's happening with our kids and with us as adults. So we hope at the end of this that our kids will learn a little bit more about balance uh, with their phone and social media, learning how to self-regulate, maybe setting specific times to go on social media, considering turning off you know, notifications from apps, monitoring the average amount of time and screen time that we have, and lots of other tips and tricks to help educate our middle school students and as, as they grow and, and learn how to find that balance. Um, and also, you know, for kids here in school, whether they're in high school or middle school, to find balance to take a break from social media and focus on their studies and their extracurricular activities as opposed to always wondering, you know, what's being said on Instagram or TikTok. So I just wanted to share that with our board and, and see if uh, you have any questions about this project. I don't have any questions, but I, I do want to thank you, Cheryl and Jessica, Brian, if you're part of this. This, this is absolutely fantastic. It's so, so needed. Um, and it's just great to see that our students and community members have an opportunity to, to be you know, involved with this. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I just, I don't have any questions, but I do have a comment. I loved, um, at the middle school, when students were not allowed to have their phones during the day, I did, as a parent, really appreciate that, um, and uh, thought it was beneficial, just not for my child at the middle school, but for all the students there as well. And um, I know it's difficult to um, get their attention, you know, when you're a teacher, because I'm, I'm doing it. I have my students all put their phones at the front of the room, before I start each class period, I count them and make sure that they're all in order and there um, before I start speaking because I know under the desk, if I don't, they'll have their phone and they'll be messaging or not paying attention, not engaged, and I want them engaged. You know, we all do. We all want students engaged during the day. So I found that, you know, it can be very distracting in an educational setting. So. I can definitely appreciate this project, and, and thank you very much, Dr. Graham. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Jessica. I'll just echo what Jay said. I really appreciate it because it is it is an issue for young people. I do have one question then, too. Do we see this as something that maybe is an ongoing thing year in and year out and continuing down that path? Or? I think it's really important because as technology and algorithms and the science behind the social media apps change and grow and adapt. Uh, we may be wearing eyeglasses that connect us to Instagram and you know smartwatches that connect us to TikTok, right? So we we just need to be able to continuously uh, educate ourselves and to you know how kids are being uh, drawn into social the social media universe and then uh, adjust accordingly. You know, so I think you're right, Jay. This, this is no one shot deal. And the nice thing about the license that we have with this film, it allows us to show it uh, from now until the end of next June. So, so, and, and that license was about five thousand uh, dollars, Ruby, somewhere around that, that ballpark. Which, which again, you know, we we purchased that so that we could do exactly what we're doing: show a small group of students, show parents, show you know middle school kids. 
and, and grow this program. Sorry, one more question. Yeah. So if your parent or someone in the community member is not able to make that preview night, is it something that we can put out or we do have to show it through our I gotta check that. It's it's okay. a little yeah, you know, it's it's copyright yeah. and protected by this this company, this indie flex company. Um, so I'm being very cautious about not live streaming the program and because of the you know the, the least amount of restrictions in COVID, I just really wanna have parents come. So so we're gonna promote the heck out of this. Yeah, that would be yeah, that would be ideal. So I just wanna say that I was at the uh, PTA council meeting last week and Brian previewed um, this program the first 10 minutes and I'm going to tell you what, what day was that last week Wednesday Thursday I can't remember what day it was I just seen 10 minutes of it I cannot tell you how much it has changed my usage like like you don't realize how many times you grab it I mean I actually watched a whole television program last night without picking up my phone right like so I just think that there's, there's I only saw 10 minutes of it and the message was to me sort of unbelievable it was all the stuff that we hear but to have someone that actually did the programming explain it to you is just amazing. So I'm really looking forward to it um, getting into the hands of both of our parents and our children because I, I really think it's a wake up call. So thank you. So we'll, uh, as, as Jessica and Brody work with the student advisory team, uh, along with uh, Mr. Broker and Mr. Fitzpatrick, we'll have uh, more concrete dates and how we roll this out with our middle school students and then with our parents. So we'll have more to come. Thank you. I'll roll through the next, are you done there? Yeah. I'll roll through the next three. So I attended the uh, district PTA um, council meeting and I just want to say that they are looking forward to the uh, celebration of inspiration this year, which is an amazing program where children get to, our seniors get to honor um, an influential person in their school career. Um, it's an event I don't like to miss. It's, it's, it's moving, it's emotional, and it's just awesome to see exactly what our teachers and staff members give to our students. And they are looking to bring back their um, installation of officers dinner. They haven't been able to do it in the last few years, and I believe we're one of the only PTAs in the area that does it, so we're very excited to get that back on the program as well. I'm going to skip the wellness committee because I think Cheryl's going to speak to that. All right, then. Um, no. <laughs> so I just, I attended Sidley PTA last week. Last week, I guess it was the week of my meetings. But um, they have a lot going on. I know they're bringing back their um, art festival this year with the Ice Cream Social, which is a fan favorite for our um, kindergarten and first graders. Um, they're starting to plan their field days for the end of the year so they're really looking to um, really bring back a lot of the stuff that we haven't had so it's exciting for our younger kids and they um, we're meeting the next day for their apex so hopefully that will be successful for them in May as well. Okay. Um, so we had a wellness committee meeting uh, last Tuesday on the 15th. Um, it was nice to be all back together. Um, it's basically been um, Sue and myself and Jessica uh, and Jay and then Robin before that. Um, but this last week we actually um, had two new town board members join us, um, Steve Marston and Tom Degatti. Um, so Jessica actually updated um, Tom and um, with everything all surrounding um, family support services. They actually um, put a link to our webpage um, on their own town, um, on their own town webpage, which was great. I know that Jessica and Tom hooked up the very next day to get that started. And then also um, Jessica gave a huge um, shout out to Mike as well and talked about how we were rolling out that social media program um, from start to finish. So I'm looking forward to our next meeting. Um, and it's great to have the board event and the town board all right together, working together for the wellness committee. So exciting. Thank you. Anything, sir? No, I skipped the Ashford. No, that's okay. No, Board of Education report. Um, the last thing that we have here is a presentation and discussion on vaping. So. Mr. Parker, can you? Uh... 
try to advance your slides for you. No problem. Good evening, Court. Uh, I'd just like to provide a quick update on the vape detection information that was requested. Uh, so back in 1920, the administrative team uh, started to look into and research the uh, vape detection devices to be installed in, in the building. So part of that was talking to a number of other high schools that used the devices, and they also toured Maryvale High School and spoke with them in January of, of 2020. Um, there, they talked about some of the, the pros and cons of the products and how effective the other schools felt that they were. So uh, af after that, you know, talking to uh, Solder Technologies, which uses a, a, a product called FlySense, um, the cost after speaking with the, the vendor for this specific school, uh, you're looking at a, they were estimating a startup cost of around 28,600 uh, for the first year with a recurring cost of about $1,600 a year for monitoring and, and the cloud service. Um, so, and the recommendation was kind of put on hold, I know, you know, going through COVID and everything like that. So this year, we kind of looked at going back now and looking at our numbers. So currently, uh, as of this year, you can see a trend starting at, starting at about 14, 15, and then kind of peaking. Uh, now this is the number of disciplinary referrals. These are individuals. This is not the number of disciplines. This is the number of individual students who were caught with a vape device or vaping on school property. Uh, so in 17, 18, we peaked at 42. Um, as of last week, Wednesday, we had 21. I believe we're about 24 right now. Okay, but that, those are those will be our current uh, numbers. And you can see in 2019-20 and 2020-21, the numbers were significantly lower. But we also had much many fewer kids in the building. It was easier to monitor, um, and just all around, we didn't have the the, the hustle and bustle of a normal school year. Um, is there a lot of repeats? Because you said that's the number of kids that were actually. Uh, we've we've had we've had a few repeaters. We've had a few repeaters, but for for the uh, the information I wanted to provide, I wanted to provide with actual numbers of individual students um, that we we've, we've had to, to put through disciplinary measures for for possessing a vape device or being caught in the bathroom. Yeah. Are these numbers just at the high school, or is that just applied? That that was that was at our high school. Okay. And um, the next oh, is our middle school. And uh, you can see the numbers are substantially lower, but there have been a few. Uh, this year there have been three as of March 16th. Um, that 18, 19 year, we saw six uh, right prior to COVID. But um, the numbers are, are definitely lower, but there have been a few instances in the middle school. So this year we went to we went back to uh, Solder Technologies for the, for the FlySense and spoke with them. Um, and one of the things that we did is, you know, we wanted to talk to them about their most recent, up-to-date technology. Because they're constantly, it's like an, an iPhone comes out every year, these devices come out every year. So we started talking about their current model and then we said, well, we wouldn't be purchasing this until after July 1 anyway, so what's gonna be around July 1? Oh, in that case, we're going to have a new model out. Mm -hmm. So we tried to get the most up-to-date information that we could. Um, so the cost of the devices average around $800, and then there's an activation fee. Um, this company does not install the devices, so that would be something that would be a, a, an expense that the district would have to incur through its own buildings and grounds to run the cables and install these throughout the um, throughout the building. One of the, um, the issues that we would have in this building is that our bathrooms are definitely larger than many other building bathrooms. And these sensors are only typically equipped to, to be effective in a 12 by 12 area. So many of, our, many of our bathrooms require two, if not more, sensors to really be effective. Um, the, the lifespan, so the minimum need for the high school would probably be about 10. 22 devices. 
configured between the tent and restrooms and the main locker rooms. Um, they do have some dummy devices that just look like monitors, but they don't, they're not actually monitoring anything. Uh, but the average lifespan of these sensors is about five years. So the traditional, the actual startup cost for the fly sense detector, detectors would be uh, a little over 18,000. And then there is a three thirty-three hundred dollar yearly monitoring fee, and uh, that is, if you notice from the nineteen twenty quote to this one, they have upgraded the model so that they can push down updates through the cloud wirelessly. If you notice in this slide, there is a hundred fifty dollar software charge per device per year up at the top, and not only did the cost of the devices because they're getting cheaper to make come down. But there's no longer that software charge because they can push down um, push down updates directly to the devices without having to do anything. Um, so today we spoke with uh, with a company called Linstar, who creates a, a Halo smart sensor. So they're the other big fish in the pond for these two companies, and um, this device has a few more bells and whistles, it is a little more expensive, but there is no reoccurring cost for yearly maintenance or yearly monitoring. Uh, it is $1,250 per device and then $2,500 per device with installation. Uh, they do provide installation, but you can see the startup cost would be $27,500 $27, with installation. It could be $55,000 to have them come and install the devices through the um, throughout the building. These also have the same 12 by 12 area reach. Um, they do offer a cloud sense program and you would have to buy a subscription to the cloud sense program if you wanted to be able to have the analytical end of the, the data collection. Uh, the current way it's set up is they'll, they'll monitor and they'll alert but as far as putting together the actual analytics of all the data over time, you would also have to subscribe to the CloudSense software for this particular product. You know what, they did not give me the cost for the CloudSense. I can inquire about that. But I only I only was able to get the actual... No, it, it is, it is. We talked about that a little bit today, like I said, we were. We had a meeting with them, but I can reach out to them and get the actual, the cost of that, uh, the monitoring. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess if you have any questions, I'll try to answer um, any questions that you might have. What are the differences between the two different um, companies and what type of uh, detection they supply? Are so they they're, they're very similar. I can tell you that. Um, just going off the top of my head now. The, the Halo smart sensor offered a couple different features that the, um, that the FlySense did not. They both have an anti-tamper feature. So if, if, the, if the device is shaken or bumped or hit or anything like that, it will notify you that it's been tampered with. Uh, one of the sensors that the Halo has that the uh, other one didn't, it has a, a photovoltaic uh, sensor to detect light, so if it's covered up by something, it will notify you that it's being covered. Okay? Um, it also has a sensor to filter particulates for, they described it as like cover sense or spraying something to kind of mask the vape. It will detect it and it'll say it's also being covered with a scent, uh, air freshener, or uh, whatever. It will, know, it, will, it will be able to detect that. And the, uh, the last part of that sensor, there was a, a third, oh, bless you. There was a third um, feature that was called a keyword feature. And that is at any time if, now both of these are equipped with microphone sensors. They do not record, but they are able to detect uh, loud noises, gunshots, um, you know, fight perhaps a large, large escalation in decibels. Okay, and you can set that level. You can also set the particulate level, 
that you want to be able to be notified of. So the parts per million in the air of a certain chemical you can set if you find it's going off nonstop and you're get, getting sent there all the time and you're not catching anybody, you could actually set the particulate level higher so there'd have to be more content in the air for it to trigger. But you can adjust that. The last part was called a keyword feature. And the way it was explained to me is if I have a student who is afraid that they're being um, bullied or assaulted or whatever, they could yell out a keyword and it would trigger an alarm in the sensor to be sent to someone. Now, I saw that as both kind of interesting and I could have people shouting keywords the whole, you know, nonstop <laughs> at me. So, <laughs> uh, so those were the those were the three variants that the Halo sensor had over the fly sense. Um, the Halo sensor also has an average lifespan they said of seven years. So, the uh, the Halo sensor was definitely more expensive. It offered a few more features and it had a two year longer lifespan. Um, but it did offer the same uh, push down updates and um, and all that. The fly sense it did come. It has a monitoring fee in it per year. And that includes the program running on all the analytics and everything like that to track trends, to track uh, what bathroom might be more popular than others, where are you getting, what time of the day. All those analytics um, are included in that, in that web software. That's with FlySense? That was with FlySense. I have the, the cost of it. Yeah. I'd have to get the cost for the smart, the halo, for the monitoring, for the the. the, the cloud-based version of that. So it sounds like both detect a change in the noise level and both detect a change in air quality. Is that what both I'm Both detect a change in air quality, both detect uh, vape, uh, THC, um, the acoustic, the, uh, the decibel levels, um, and they have the tamper-resistant feature. Okay. Um, one more question I had. When we um, had cameras installed, the, we purchased the cameras, did we, are they within, um, are you able to see who goes in and out of the bathrooms with the cameras that we have installed in the high school and middle school? So I have cameras that face the, the doors of the bathroom. So I'm, I'm going to be able to see and use them before to see who is in there a specific time. I do not have any cameras that face into the bathroom no. or anything like that, but, but I can't, I do monitor them. But you can tell if you get a report that at 12 o'clock every Tuesday, or 12 o'clock on Tuesday, Absolutely. this certain day, the air quality changed, you could look on the camera and see who's going to I can tell, you, I can tell you when and when and where already. And then monitor those students right. to see when they're so we have rear using friends. the bathroom. Yep. Okay. So it might be interesting to reach out to these companies and provide us with other local people, actually many districts, right, that use these products actual um, you know, deterring it or yeah I know North Tonawanda has used it for a few years now and they've had um, some success with it that's why Lewis and Porter is installing them right now because you know North Tonawanda had success with identifying students that needed help and then being able to get them assistance um, that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to identify and pretty much um, looking at the patterns and then being able to go back on the uh, cameras to see who was entering the bathrooms when the air quality changed and then keeping track of those students to be able to pretty much you know, catch them catch them in the act of, of vaping. Then you, you kind of know who to look for and when they're using the bathroom and, and which bathrooms are typically used. Um, yeah. I guess it would be really um, helpful to get they have the actual numbers from North Sunwanda or somebody else that has them. I mean, if they, you know, if it went from, if it doubled or if, if, if not, I mean, you know, my, my concern or my question would be is, is the vaping's not only happening in the bathrooms, it's happening in our hallways and in some cases in our classrooms. Um, and that's just from students speaking about it. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're vaporless, right? Like, it's, um, so I'm just wondering if, if, if we feel that we would just be moving the problem from our bathrooms to our hallways. Um, 
and really what the effectiveness would be to capture the issue we have with vape vaping. I mean, we can all agree that it's definitely an issue and something we would like to, to be able to control and work with the kids that need the help. But I just want to make sure that if we're going to put a system in place that A, it's effective, and um, we're not just moving the problem from one room to another. And then I would, I would just ask you, um, as the principal, I mean, we have 42 instances this year. I mean, clearly there's many more, but do you feel what we have in place is effective, not effective? I mean, um, 21. I can tell you that we, uh, no, we you know, and as the year goes on, you know, we, we work to try and strategically place ourselves in certain places around the building at certain times, not only to catch students, but also to deter them. And, you know, we work with our staff, and we, we are constantly adapting and monitoring what's going on. So I, I can't say that we probably would have more than, I mean, we might have a few more if we had the system, but, um, you know, walking into a bathroom that has the sensors going off, and I have 15 students in that bathroom. So now I'm, you know, one of my things is, so am I bringing all 15 down to search in the, in the you know, like, like, I don't know how to, you know, it's easier to go walk into the bathroom and I can kind of identify kind of what's going on. I, I kind of know, we kind of know who the typical players okay. are. So I can't say it wouldn't it wouldn't help, but you know we're always monitoring. I know one of the things that the, the companies continually pitch is that they're always updating their software and trying to stay up with the latest technology. Mm -hmm. But um, you know I can tell you, having done this for a while, that the, just in the past four or five years, the, the devices themselves and what they do has dramatically changed. It's, you know, so. Um, I don't know, but I can reach out to some other administrators and get some more information about the pros and cons of what they, how they've used it in their building, and whether they feel it's it's an effective tool or they've, you know, kind of felt that it's might have been a waste. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think there's advantages to it. I'm, I was just curious. I mean, it's, you know, it's it's definitely worth it if we can help our students. I just. Um, they stay one step ahead of us, right? right. And it's, it's ever-changing. I know Jessica Hutchins has, has really educated me a lot with vaping through the Wellness Committee. And um, they change the vapor list, their odor list, their... So I just don't, you know, I don't particularly understand how these devices would be able to, to pick that up. Um, but anyways, I, th those are just my questions. I, I know it's an ongoing issue, and I know you guys are doing all that you can with it now, I'm just wondering how much more the devices will bring to the table. Yeah, I, I can't really answer that. Mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to be as proactive as we can. Um, so, like I said, I can reach out to some other colleagues awesome. and try to find out the effectiveness of it in their building. I have one additional question. Um, Sue made a good point about moving the problem elsewhere. Is um, Did the companies mention anything about having these vape detectors installed in, say, stairwells or anywhere anywhere other than bathrooms so that the <laughs> problem simply isn't moved to another location? You can, you can install them anywhere anywhere in the building. Um, they still have the same effective range, and I think that's where you might get a problem with. And they're only really effective in about an 8 to 9 foot ceiling. So if you were to put it in a stairwell, it really is not going to be very effective because of the, the square footage of the area and the volume with, with okay. the ceiling. Um, you know, the difference uh, in some of the sensors, like the audio sensors they said is about a 50 by 50 foot range. So different sensors have different uh, parameters and, and, uh, and radius that they're, they're effective, but the actual um, particulate it has to be in kind of a confined area. Okay. I have a question. Mr. Oh, sorry, I'm going to put you on the spot, Mr. Fitzpatrick. About how many bathrooms 
do you think there would be in the middle school? And do you think there's more going on in the middle school than we see that you well, need them there? I'd always say that, right? Yeah. The number that you see on the screen is not indicative of probably the truth, you know, that you can find. Um, 17, 18 year, the six incidents that we had were three duplicates, which means there's one person who helped three of the incidents, incidents uh, that year with three of the referrals. Um, so the, the issue with the middle school, we have three, three sets of bathrooms, not excluding the uh, two gender neutral bathrooms that we have. Um, but, you know, it, it's like Roger said, in, in all things, it's the major deterrent is always people. You know, it's like an installation of a camera it doesn't necessarily deter crime from being committed anywhere on the campus or anything like that. But it, it's the people, like Roger was saying, where you place people. Um, you know, this might be a deterrent, but um, people are smart, and uh, you know, so if it's if they're addicted, it's not going to take place in the bathroom once they know there's a. Um, you know, they'll find another way to do it. Um, the other thing is, too, I think the level between the middle school, and this is with all kids, right? Your, your idea of invincibility increases with age. So, with no low numbers in the middle school, it's natural to see higher numbers in high school. Um, you know, as much of the education that you try to give in that middle school environment, you know, it's always going to be higher. Yeah, that's a nice question. Have you had any instances in our elementary buildings? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Kids just tend to start younger and younger with certain things, right? Like, mm -hmm. A couple of years ago. A couple of years ago. Pre-COVID, right? Yeah, pre-COVID. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, okay, we did not have anyone sign up for the public comment session, so that brings us to Committee of the Whole items and information for the roundtable beginning with Jay. Um, nothing really, just good luck to all our uh, spring sports teams and uh, looking forward to some nicer weather and mm -hmm. <laughs> seeing everyone outside and active. Nicole. I don't have anything to say. Okay, I just wanted to send my condolences out to the entire Coon family and um, let you know that we are thinking about her soon. I don't have anything on all I just want to take a moment to thank and all of our teachers for staff development this past uh, Friday, as well as the presenters and employees for their hard work and participation. I also want to thank our committee. Um, Jeannie's out there. I know Felicia and John are both That's members of our committee. And uh, yes, you're going to recognize everyone. Applause. <laughs> um, I'll just say it was my first year working with the committee, and there were a little bit of ups and downs in any work that you do. But in the end, I've learned a lot, and I look forward to working with them down the road. So thank you, guys. Um, two things. One, uh, so two things popped in my head. I did want to say there is a procedure for conference and trail if you ever want to see that information. And there's a mileage bonus. Sorry, it's just going through my head. There are five people that went, and one did take the train to cut down and came back with the staff. Sorry. Um, and secondly, which this is a, a big item and it's going to be very important, not only for our district, but um, all districts uh, across the U.S., um, the child nutrition waiver that was going on is set to end this June. Um, that has a huge financial implication for uh, all districts. We are talking about it heavily. Um, in New York, uh, the federal government in their proposals, it was not included. I think we kind of just assumed it would continue. Um, so it is something that we are bringing to uh, not only our local, but pushing it as high as we can. Um, another thing that conflicts with 
uh, not continuing the waiver is the no lunch shaming policy that was implemented a couple years ago. So um, even if we go back to a paid environment, um, there are that policy still stands. So uh, we have a lot of concerns on what are the financial implications, um, how do we handle that, and what that means for our program. So uh, Dr. Graham did send something out today um, to to just push our teachers and our staff to support this. I will provide more information um, at the next board meeting. It just kind of hit in, in between our deadline of when things were due to submit. So you'll hear more about that, but um, it's, it's huge for all districts and, and there's a lot of concerns all over the state. That's it. Thank you, and Dr. Graham. Yep, I'm all set, thank you. Okay, um, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn the regular board meeting at 8 49 p.m. Or, sorry, 8, 8, I'm sorry, 8.39. 8.39. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Motion carried. We need adjourn. Thank you.